Friends, what a joy it is to welcome our new bishop. Uh, if we haven't met already, my, my name is Bob Rhodes, and I have the privilege of serving as your conference secretary. I am a little sad that I'm not hearing ukulele music right now as I speak. <laughs> so only half the room has seen the videos. Thank you. Uh, uh, I have some opening motions, but before we do that, I have a couple of things. Uh, first, I would like for us to simply say a word of thanks to all the workers who are here providing services, uh, meals. We have some folks who are going to come in. We just want to take a minute to recognize the workers of the Sheridan Gateway, and I want to recognize this annual conference and its leadership for choosing a union hotel. That means <laughs> it's a powerful observation of faith to choose to invest our resources in sustaining wages and health insurance for families, and I want to thank you. You can thank these workers and all the workers who will be serving us, providing the sacred act of hospitality throughout the weekend by greeting them, thanking them, and grabbing one of these buttons, which we're going to share, to show your solidarity and support for them at this time. Thank you so much to those who make our event amazing. You can also uh, think about when they're helping you to give them a really great tip. Thank you, friends. Uh, we're going to set the mood with a video. A movement is in the air, like a flock of starlings flying through the sky in complex yet beautiful patterns. We, the people of the California Pacific Annual Conference, have the opportunity to fly together in new and creative ways. At times, it may feel as if we are not making progress because our varied flocks don't appear to be flying in a uniform V formation. But a closer examination reveals the beauty of our difference, that conformity is not required, and that we are indeed soaring together as one. We represent one of the most diverse conferences in the entire connection. We celebrate a wide diversity of racial, socioeconomic, liturgical, and theological perspectives. And still, we are brought together in the unity of a shared mission to end hunger in all its forms. We fly together to bring an end to the leading cause of hunger, poverty. Or as Jeremiah 29 verses 4 through 7 puts it, to bring an end to the absence of shalom. As our denomination experiences a time of flux and transition from what has been to what will be, we look to an unknown but hopeful future. At times it may feel messy and overwhelming. Shalom can be a precious commodity. It can be tiring to continue to flap our wings when the completion of the journey is unknown. The picture of what's to come may appear to be unclear and abstract. But if we will dare to continue extending our wings in faith, God's promise will undoubtedly sustain us. It is in our discipleship and devotion to the one who guides us that we can address the poverty that surrounds us in the world we are ministering in. We will fly together to combat the systematic inequality and discrimination that is so much a part of our present reality. As our collective murmuration ebbs and flows, we will seek to bring peace in conflict. We will advocate to protect our environment in this time of climate change. And we will feed those suffering from food insecurity and malnutrition. The journey is long and perilous. We won't get there overnight. In order to fly higher and further and to deal with these pressing needs, it is imperative that we rest and refuel. 
After years of flying through turbulent air, we could all use a time of centering, soul work, and respite. Are you ready to be nourished in mind, body, and spirit? Will you accept the invitation? Bishop and members of the annual conference, both members who are here in the room and our friends who are online, it is a privilege to serve you, uh, particularly as we work through the business of the annual conference. Uh, we will be doing a number of votes throughout this uh, session, uh, both today, tomorrow, and, and Saturday, and I want to help you to vote so that then we can approve our opening motions. Uh, so I want to remind you that if you are uh, at home, you don't need to worry about the Wi-Fi in this room, but if you are in this room, you will want to join uh, the Marriott Bonvoy Conference. Now, some of us brought multiple devices. If you're a geek like me, you may have too many, and that's okay. We have a thousand nodes on the Wi-Fi, which should be enough for all of us. And if you have multiple devices, choose to take care so that others might be able to connect as well. Are we agreed? Good. Let's proceed with our first vote, which is just going to be a test vote. Uh, as you uh, were reminded in the, the video that was posted a while back with the ukulele music, music uh, that um, there is a link that was sent to you. It was sent to you on Monday of this week, and that has your voting credentials on it. So if you're going to use a mobile device, an iPad, a tab on a browser, you need to click that link so that you can uh, uh, access your specific and individual voting. If you do this on multiple devices, that's not going to work well because you can only vote once, and that's part of our voting integrity. So that's the thing that you need to do. So I would invite you to bring up uh, uh, your voting device. Uh, make sure that you have clicked that link already, and I believe that we have a test question. You want to come on up? Yeah, come on up. Well, let's do it. Both? Good morning, Bishop. Good morning, members of the annual conference. My name is Leah Booth, and I'm the legislation chair, and I'm going to help you all vote. So if you have clicked through the link in your emails or uh, entered the appropriate credential, um, in the session and the meeting and your ID, then you will have seen a welcome question, the Lord be with you. And you should have been able to submit that. If you haven't done that yet and you log, and you log into the voting, you'll see that. If you've already submitted, then the screen will say your answer is successfully saved. So I'm going to stop that question. It's okay if you didn't get to respond. And I'm going to broadcast our first practice our practice vote when we vote I will do my best or Matt McPhee back there will do our best to get the question to your devices in advance of the of the bishop opening the vote so you'll have the question on your screen for a, a little bit and then the bishop will open the vote she'll say something like please vote now or you may vote now so when she says that Please vote now. We'll start the timer, and that's when you'll be able to vote. If you don't see a submit button on your screen, try scrolling up or uh, try refreshing your screen, or even try logging out and logging in again. Um, the timers are short so that we can move our business along, uh, but you should have the opportunity to vote. So votes are coming in. We have several opening motions, so you'll have some time to get used to the system if, you're, if you haven't successfully done it already. Just a few more seconds. Pick your poison. When the vote has concluded, you'll see a, a screen that says that brought the, oops, that's my fault. <clears throat> you'll see a screen that says the results will be broadcast shortly, then we'll broadcast the results and they'll come up. 
Nobody chose anything, <laughs> apparently. <laughs> That's probably a glitch in the system. That should get better. You, you all successfully cast your votes. Thank you so much for practicing. We'll have our opening motions for you to keep practicing. There may be some who have some questions or have some trouble connecting. We have two tables in the back. Uh, if, uh, see, well, I'm just going to point you out. Uh, the Reverend Juan Sukya is uh, able to help out. We've got some other folks about the room who can help you out. So let someone know if you're having some trouble. Uh, but I'd like to move us into our business with our opening motions. Uh, I have five opening motions. The first is, Bishop, I move to set the bar of the 39th annual session of the California Pacific Conference to be. Members of the conference, as specified by the discipline and the rules of the conference, as well as lay members of the Board of Ordained Ministry, the Bishop's Secretary, and such other persons as specified by the Bishop and approved by the conference, authenticated and connected through the Zoom webinar and or VPOL platforms, present in our broadcast location and or present in the Grand Ballroom of the Sheraton Gateway Hotel, Los Angeles, the staff and technical crew, and the registrar and others designated by the registrar uh, shall ensure that these participants are among those named in those first two sections. So Bishop, uh, I make this motion. The motion is before you. You can take out your devices and you may vote now. You have approved. Bishop, I move that the agenda in the participant guide be the official agenda of this 39th annual session of the California Pacific Conference, and that the agenda chair and or conference secretary be authorized to make necessary adjustments in consultation with the bishop. The motion is before you. You can go ahead and vote. Thank you, friends. You have approved. Sorry, Bishop. Yeah, <laughs> go for it. <laughs> friends, I move that the proceedings published in the UM Daily be the official minutes of this 39th annual session of the California Pacific Conference after they are corrected and approved. The motion is before you. You may vote now. You have approved. 
Bishop, I move that the, regis the registration forms and the registrar's list of those who have signed in to the online platforms shall be used as the official roll call of the 39th annual session of the California Pacific Conference. The motion is before you. You may vote now. You have approved. And finally, Bishop, I move that all resolutions not adopted by the end of this 39th annual session of the California Pacific Conference be referred to the appropriate entities. The motion is before you. You may vote now. And you have approved. Uh, thank you, friends, for beginning this good work. Thank you, Bob. Good morning, Bishop and members of the annual conference. Welcome to Plenary One. I am Kathy Cap. I am you're serving here as your agenda chair, and we have a lot of work to do. And so I invite you to look at the screens, which will be displaying our orders for Plenary One shortly. There are two slides with our work for this morning. And I invite you to be in a spirit of openness and flexibility as we work through this and move things around. But Bishop, I move the orders for the day. The motion is before you. You can take out your devices. And you may vote now. And you have approved. Thank you so much, Kat. Katie. And now we have announcements. Juan Sook. Bishop Escobedo Frank, the cabinet, and siblings in Christ of the CAPAC Annual Conference, aloha. 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 That's the one thing we can all say together. So glad for those of us who are here and joining us on Zoom in this space. I am Won Suk Yeo, clergy of Harris United Methodist Church, and that is my first reminder to you all of what to do when you get to the microphone. Say your name, whether you're a clergy or a laity, and where you're from. I want to remind you all of things that you already know with the ukulele sound. <laughs> yeah, some of you know it. You understand that we have some legislation that comes up, and we invite you to go to calpacumc.org uh, calpac slash AC2023. The reason for that is because we're going to have new updates constantly coming up. And you may have noticed if you paid attention, we have advanced specials, updates on a camp legislation, and a new nominations update. 
Now, as we go on, we're not going to keep reminding you. I'll try. But you'll see three asterisks, and that's what you'll know has been updated since the last time you've seen it. So please go there to find all your legislation as necessary. And as you're in this space, yes, we may have multiple devices. We have Wi-Fi. But if you are in this space and you see my face, you don't need to be on Zoom. I see you, I stand in the back. <laughs> if you're here, you don't need to be on Zoom, but for those of you on Zoom, if you have any questions and problems, you know you can go to the Q&A for the moderators to help you there. But for everyone else here, if you need some help, I will now be visible. I'll be in the back corner for you all if you have questions. But along with Wi-Fi, what we're noticing is that already I'm hearing some rumblings about I couldn't vote or something's not working. I see it says the question will be broadcasted shortly, but you don't see anything. I want to remind you on that email that you received from Jennifer Gaylord this past Monday, there are multiple links. You're going to look for the one that says it's for the plenary for these sessions for these days. So go back to it if you haven't seen that yet, but I promise you it's working. If you're having some problems, again, you can come to me in the back. This has been requested of you all, of those of you who are joining us for meals in the California ballroom, please do not go outside this door. I know some of you want to just get a free meal but we want to do this in justice, and we also want to do it in lines. So if you could, if you're lining up for any of the meals in the California ballroom, please exit out the side doors and proceed in a line across the glass wall over there. All right? We can do that, because we know how to walk in lines. All right. Sounds good. We're doing great. And the last bit is that as we're here together and as we're sharing this space, we remind you once again to share your aloha. Aloha meaning the mutual care of love for those who serve, those who work. If you would share some words of appreciation, some kindness, if you would be gentle when you are frustrated, we would appreciate it, and we will be gentle back with you. May we be in Christian love together as we serve and as we love in this space. Mahalo. Thank you, Ansa. Bishop and friends, I have one additional announcement, uh, and then we will move forward with our orders of the day. That brief announcement is that Resolution 23-01 has been withdrawn by those who submitted it, so it will not fall on the agenda. Good morning, Bishop Dottie and beloved community. My name is Melissa Rue McKinnon, and I have the pleasure of serving as the North District Superintendent and Dean of the Cabinet. And so today, it is with great joy that I introduce our new bishop, Bishop Dadi Escobedo Frank. And will you, yes, give her a warm and loving welcome. cry before I start. <laughs> thank you, thank you. I've always loved birds. I watched my grandma raise parakeets when um, I was young. She raised them because she lived alone as her friends, and she would talk to them and say, pretty bird, pretty bird, and the birds would answer her with a high musical note. I always thought, uh, even though they were just singing back to her, I always thought they were saying, Pretty bird, pretty grandma. <laughs> My sister, isn't she cute? <laughs> Look at those glasses. My sister has an affinity for birds, and when she was young, she'd go out into the field and sit down on the grass and talk to the birds and hold her arms out until the birds would come and land on her arms or be close to her on the ground. Recently, I asked her about that, and I said, what were, you, what were you doing, and how did that happen for you? She says, I don't know. I just go out there when nobody else is around. I like birds. They like me. I, I know that in Patagonia, Arizona, which is a tiny town in the southern desert, uh, people come from all over the world to bird watch there. 
If you go there, the background to your day will be the differing sounds in the air that are birds' songs. And I grew up near there, about 18 miles south of Patagonia. And there in Nogales, I heard the backdrop of songs, bird songs, all of my life. I can still identify some of the birds by their sound, the types of birds by their sound. And so when I saw the image for our annual conference was murmuration, the sound and movement of starlings flying together, this picture that we have here, well, I was instantly captivated. When starlings fly together, they paint a picture of swirling art in the sky, much like the kaleidoscope that we used as toys of our childhood. They make a sound like a murmur, or I might say like a loud whisper of movement. If you listen to the sound and watch the movement, you'll be mesmerized by the beauty and the hum of God's creation. At the end of the day, these starlings who fly together, they're, when they're done flying the skies, they fly together to land on the land on a safe place to rest and prepare for their next day. The story of murmuration is a story of taking periods of rest. We like the visual of them being in the sky and doing their sky art. But if you follow what they're doing at the end of the day, you'll see them all land together and rest. This speaks to me today in the period where we are talking about nourishment and nourishing our souls. There was a period in my life many years ago when I needed a rest from what was happening in my community, my church community. We uh, started to feed uh, some people who were living on the streets and the crowd grew and the, some of the people, neighbors nearby, didn't like what we were doing and so there was a a cease and desist order that came to my church from the city of Phoenix. And then it, it uh, hit the news. And one day my DS called me and said, uh, you're on the news. And I said, I'm not on, I was in the airport. I'm not on the news. I'm, I'm here. I haven't talked to anybody. She said, no, your story, the story of your church feeding those who are on the street, it's on the news. And um, it went viral around the world. And we received feedback from all over the world about what we were doing in this church. Um, I, had, I, I, have, I have a hope for you that you never have a story that goes viral. <laughs> because though it sounds wonderful, it's not. Uh, when you go viral, you also have people who, who send you hate mail and who tell you all the things that are wrong with you, things that have nothing to do with what you're doing in the community. I had people call me racist names and question why I could be doing what I was doing because I'm, I'm not male. And um, so it, it, it became hurtful. And everywhere I, I went, the, the, uh, the cameras would follow me, the news cameras. And uh, after a while of this going viral, when, when I didn't know how to handle this big event that was happening around me, um, my soul just got tired. You can fight and struggle and, and, and do the right thing, but in the end, we all need a rest, and I needed a rest. I asked for a rest from my cabinet, and I was denied a couple of times. And then the third time, which was a year or so later, maybe two, I was given a rest. And my mom asked me, Dottie, what are you going to do with your rest? I was going to take six weeks away. And she said, what are you going to do? I said, I'm going to San Diego because there's an ocean there. And I'm going to sit and I'm going to read and just not talk to anybody. <laughs> and she uh, says, you're going to talk to me, right? <laughs> <laughs> of course, Mama. And so um, I found a one-room studio in San Diego right on the beach or near the beach. I slept in, I walked on the ocean, I read when I could, 
And Jim visited me on weekends for six weeks. So my pattern was just that. Though this rest was one and a half to two years too late, my soul was struggling deeply because it had taken so long for me to get to this place of needing and receiving the rest I needed to recover. My, my soul, I was hoping, would someday want to be in the world again. But at this moment, I just wanted to be alone. And so I sat there and saw the ocean, I watched the seagulls, uh, uh, felt the sand, uh, noticed the quiet, and loved the lack of responsibility for a minute, enjoyed the fish tacos, <laughs> and bit by bit, my body and my soul was restored. There's a story in our scriptures about Elijah. Elijah is running from King Ahab, and he runs to hide in the Wadi Cherith, which is the dry riverbed. And God provides water from the Wadi, and the ravens come to him and feed him, give him bread and meat every morning and every night. And then eventually the water, the little bit of water that's in the Wadi dries up, and there's no more water in the land because there's a drought. And so Elijah leaves and goes and finds the starving widow of Zarephath. She finds, he finds her and her son. And while he is there, food is provided for them. The second part of this story is that Elijah, after he has been fed, he, he runs away again, this time from King Ahab's wife Jezebel, who has threatened his life. And he runs away to the wilderness of Beersheba and sits alone under the broom tree. And he asks God a question. He asks God, God, won't you just let me die? Elijah runs away to the wilderness of Beersheba and sits alone under that broom tree, asking God to die and, and just pours his soul out. And I know some of you have heard that question before. Perhaps some of you have asked that question before. I know as a pastor, there have been many times where people who are suffering because of illness or because or are, are elderly in age and they've lost so many people before them, they've said to me, Pastor, it's my turn. Why won't God just take me? So Elijah says to God, it's enough now. God, take my life. For I am no better than my ancestors, the people who have gone before me. And then Elijah falls asleep under the broom tree. And later, an angel wakes Elijah up and touches him and says, get up and eat. And there at his head was a, a cake baked on hot stones. Now, you, you might not understand that here in this kind of country, but in the desert, you can bake a cake on a hot stone in the summertime. <laughs> Just let me tell you. You can, bake, you can cook an egg. You can cook a lot of things outside. So there he wakes up, and there's a cake and some water. Wouldn't you like God to bake you a cake? I mean, how would that make you feel that God made me a cake? And then he laid down again, went to sleep, and then an angel woke him up the second time and tells him to eat and drink. And then he was sent to the cave on Mount Horeb, and God says to him, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> and he, Elijah replies to God, God, I've been very zealous for you, but the people left you and tore down your altars and killed your prophets and I alone and am left, and they're after me too to kill me. You, you hear what he's saying, right? Uh, nobody God is following you. I'm the only one in the whole earth who's following you. And they want to kill me right now. That's what I'm doing here. Now I want to tell you a third story. God decides to show God's self to Elijah. And God says, go out and stand on the mountain, for the Lord will pass by you. So 
he's standing on a mountain and um, there was a great wind and the wind was so great that it was breaking up the rocks and splitting the mountains. But the Lord, it says, was not in the wind. And then there was this great earthquake. I haven't experienced that yet, but I hear I will. There's earthquakes here, right? <laughs> but the Lord was not in the earthquake. And then, and then there was a fire I have, I've had that happen. I lost a, my house to a fire when I was a teenager. There was this big fire, but it says the Lord was not in the fire. And then it says there was the sound of sheer silence, and God was in the silence. And then when Elijah experiences God in the silence, God asks him again, what are you doing here, Elijah? <laughs> and Elijah wasn't a very quick learner <laughs> because he says, I've been zealous for you. I've done all these things for you. Others left or were killed, and I'm the only one left, and they're trying to kill me too. He's saying the same pitiful story. And God, you know, doesn't even, re doesn't even respond to his pity, <laughs> self-pity. He says, God says, go, return and anoint Hazael as king over Aram, and anoint Jehu as king over Israel, and anoint Elisha as a prophet in your place. I love these stories. Because God hears Elijah's cries. God takes care of his hunger and his thirst and gives him rest. And then God sends him back and says, get back to work. <laughs> I want you to anoint the next ones for ministry and prepare for the future. Uh, as uh, a new bishop, I've been trying to get to as many of the locations as I, as I can around our conference. And as I've been able to move around, I have listened to your your stories. I've asked you questions about how goes it with your soul. I've asked you where your joys are and where your concerns are. And, and what I've noticed as I've walked around our conference as we've come out of the period of the pandemic, I've noticed that your souls are tired and that you have the desire to do the best that you can, but there is no energy sometimes. I've, ha I've heard your cries when I've asked you to sh tell me what's going on. I've heard your cries asking for God to show up and take over and care for us and show us the way. As I've walked around and listened, I hear this hope, whisper of hope and cry for help. And I want you to know that, it's, that you're not alone in that. This is happening all around the world. It's happening in church world a lot. And I believe that churches experienced something really different as we went through the pandemic than, than even some of the other organizations that also experienced hardships. And I believe that we did an amazing job at holding together and staying community while we couldn't see each other face to face except on Zoom or on your screen. And, but I think that came at a cost. I think your hard and good work to stay connected to each other uh, made some of us weary and wrestling and wondering and questioning our call and the purpose of the church. So I want to ask you to do something for us this year for each other, for God, for our conference. I want to ask you to take regular rests and Sabbaths. Do you know that it says in the creation story, after God created all the good stuff, God rested? Do you think that if God needs rest that maybe we don't ever? <laughs> and did you know it's one of the ten? 
commands. It's, the, it's a positive command. Take the Sabbath day, make it holy. Have a day of rest in the middle of your week. And do you know that Jesus, when he was walking the lands of the holy territories, he rested frequently. If you check out the phrase, let us go to the other side. The other side is the other side of the lake. And that was to get away from the crowds of people so that he and the disciples could rest. So I would like us to consider rest as not only a gift, but a necessity in order for us to be the people that God has called us to be in this moment of time in the world. And so I would like for you to take a Sabbath every week. Now, i got to tell you, the, the pastors among us, um, I can say this because I'm one, um, we're the worst at this. <laughs> we are. Your Sunday when you're with people is not your Sabbath, just in case you didn't figure that out yet. <laughs> um, and when you take a Sabbath, you need to not be available and have somebody else to be called for, for um, emergencies. And pastor, do you know that there's amazing laity in your churches who can respond to your calls? <laughs> And, and I'll talk to you more about our laity sometime, but they are a gift. You are a gift to the church, that one that we have not recognized well or utilized well, and we need to ask you for your, your forgiveness. But I also want to say the same thing to laity. If you are one of those persons, and you might be just because you're here, who, who go to every meeting in your church and your family never knows um, when you'll be home because you're at that church meeting again, um, you need a rest too. You need to recycle yourself and off the committees and make sure that other people get a chance and that to lead and that you get a chance to refresh. And so what, however it works for you in your life, find a day to rest. And at this particular time, because of the cries that I've heard from our clergy, I would like to request, to ask, to beg of you. Uh, I'm not demanding, but I am begging. Please, at this moment, talk to your district superintendent and get an extra one to three months off so that you can restore your soul, so that you can be ready for the church that needs you today. Please do that first. And laity, if I was your boss, I would say the same thing to you, but I'm not. But find a way to get some extra rest during this period of time so that you too can be the strength of our churches. And I would, I would like to ask all of us to connect deeply with our friends and our families. Do you know who's going to be there when you are buried? It won't be your church people. It's going to be your families and your close friends. They're going to be the ones that show up at your memorial service, your celebration of life service. And if only church people show up, Oh, man. <laughs> Do you know your family needs you? Needs you. They need you so they can breathe. They need you so they can know their love. They need you because, because they, they, they need to connect, and you're the trustworthy one they connect with. So don't forget them. They were a call before you were called to the ministry. So stay connected to your family and your friends. And I want to ask you to find something outside of church to enjoy. Do you know there's a whole world out there? <laughs> Do you know that there's islands you've never set foot on? Do you know that there are, 
are things that you've always wanted to do that you, you could experience and find time to do? Do you know that there's somebody who needs to meet you but you haven't met yet because you haven't made yourself available as you walk around the town? Do you know there's somebody at the grocery store who you see on a regular basis and that person this day may need to know that you are their friend because you show up every week? Do you know there's, there's uh, universes to explore, books to read, uh, places to see under the ocean? I won't be doing that, but I'll be looking at pictures of that. Uh, there, are, <laughs> there are vineyards to see on the other side of the world. Enjoy something, something outside of church. What I can tell you about that experience when you enjoy something outside of church that God will meet you there, and God will restore your joy as you do that. So clergy and laity, leaders of our church, I am asking that you take time now to rest and restore your soul. And I'm also asking for um, us to begin our journey together addressing one of the things I've heard, which is a lack of trust and a need for transparency in our conference. You know, when we get tired, or we, when we have gone through a group of struggles or difficulties, we start to question everything, and we question trust, who we trust. And we need to start this era in the United Methodist Church with a basic sense of trust. I want to tell you <clears throat> that trust is earned. Don't just throw it away to anybody. Let it be earned between you and someone else. Know that we will earn our trust together. Know that trust is risky. You're going to take some small risks and sometimes fall on your face and forgive yourself and others and Get up and try it again. Trust is risky. And, and I, I want you to, to try to take big risks with God and ask God the questions that you can barely say out loud. Because trusting God is not risky. It is the faithful and sure thing for us to do. So I want us to build a conference built on trust. And I know everybody wants that but I want us to actually really try, try to do that. And so let us begin to build our conference on trust with transparency. I want us to have financial transparency. You'll hear more about that later in the conference. I want us to understand when we get uh, reports, for example, on racial disparities that we are we are providing that information so that we can all see what is really happening among us and be transparent with each other, not just so that we can note that, but so that we can admit our mistakes and make needed changes. In many areas of the conference, I'm asking us to be transparent, to begin our journey together to seek trust, to seek to earn trust, and to have transparency. And I, I, I want you to do all this, all this nourishing and resting, because there's a vision that we have for the future and the present in our conference. And there's a vision for discipleship and for evangelism and for new starts and for new ways of being church and for for finding out where God is in the world today and going there. We have a vision to let ourselves be reformed by God, by God's grace. And the vision that helps us to live into this day and say we were a part of what God was up to, that when God said to us, get back to work, we were ready. So we must rest and nourish ourselves so that when we see the people who are hungry and thirsty literally living on our streets and beaches and freeways, we will be able to respond. So that when we 
see that there are well-fed and well-hydrated people who are spiritually hungry and thirsty, we will be there for them. As we center our local churches and our local ministries with the structures being supportive and resourcing around the local environments, the local churches, the local ministries, we need to care for those out there that we know are hurting. Some of them you know about, and some we might not yet know. But let's start with those migrants who are hungry and thirsty and get dropped off in our town and need a welcoming heart. Let's start with black men and their families who hunger and thirst for a chance at safety and life. Let's start with LGBTQ folks who are hungry and thirsty for acceptance and beloved community. Let's start with our divided country who is hungry and thirsty for beloved community where all are respected and where we can talk to each other. Let's start with our earth that is hungry and thirsty to be given a chance to heal so that it can sustain us again. Let's start with our financial su sustainability for the conference so that we are able to live into our future with ease. And not just our conferences, but that would do well in our churches as well. We need to find a new way of being church because today is a new day, new way, new day, new church. In San Diego, the ocean, the sand, the quiet, the lack of responsibility restored my body and soul. As I said before, I did nothing but read, walk the beach, eat, drink, sleep, write down my thoughts, and do that over and over and over again for weeks until slowly my strength and my vitality and my hopes returned. I started dreaming about what my little church could be again. I started strategizing our next steps on paper. I made lists of new leaders, people we hadn't noticed before. And then one day I looked down at what I had written on my paper and looked down at the dreams that were forming out of my hand into this piece of paper and I said to myself, oh Dottie, you are now restored. <laughs> You're better. You better get back to work. I ended my time there by taking moments every day to thank God, usually while I walked the beach, for all that God had done for me, for all the ways that God had cared for me, and for all the dreams God had placed inside of me. I thanked God for newly found joy. And I came back to my church and finished out with more strength. And we settled the court cases. We continued to care for those who were living on the streets. And we began to focus differently our work for those in our neighborhood. One day, after a meeting with Bishop, our new bishop, Bishop Hoshibata, and showing him around our church and having him meet the people there. He was just going around, just trying to get to know people, just sharing ministry with him. He asked me quietly, how long do you think you'll stay here? <laughs> I was at that time in year eight or nine, probably eight. And I looked around knowing we had many years of doing good work together, and I admitted to him that I could be ready for something else perhaps in a year or two or three. And a little bit of time later, Bishop Hoshibata called me and asked me to serve on the cabinet. When he asked me to serve on the cabinet, he did it this way. He said, Dottie, I know this good thing and this good thing and this good thing and this good thing and this good thing about you. And he went on naming good things about me for about 20 minutes. <laughs> and, you know, he doesn't talk a lot. <laughs> but he had them written down, and he was telling me why he was asking me to be on the cabinet. And my soul was just stunned by the invitation and the gracious love that he poured over my soul. And I thought, what a change. Not too long before that, 
I was near burnout, if not fully burned out, <laughs> that God restored my soul and brought me to this place where there was a new door that was opening. You know, I almost left the church and the ministry during that time. That's not a notable thing, though, because I do that frequently inside. <laughs> I say, <laughs> you know, maybe I could go do something else. God and I talk about that a lot. <laughs> Some of you know that feeling. But instead, God fed me and filled my thirst and ministered to my soul until I was able to carry on again. You can't be restored or rest ord without first getting rest. You can't be without hunger without first getting food. You can't quench your thirst without some living water. And just as we can't experience resurrection, the thing we're hoping for in this moment, without first letting some things die. The other day, I was um, on the computer in my house, and um, I heard this loud racket outside, and it went on and on, and so finally I opened my door, and I went, I, I was like, what is that? And it was a flock of parrots yakking away in a nearby tree. <laughs> um, they were talking and talking and shouting at each other across branch, branches. They were having a parrot convention. And it made me laugh with joy. The sound of starling murmurations. I think Jason may have that sound for us. Can you play that, Jason? It's a quieter sound. It's a steady sound. It's a steady sound of birds' wings flapping. It's a sound like a strong wind, maybe like the Holy Spirit, moving across the earth in free form <laughs> until quietly they land on the earth to rest. The sound of flocks of parrots was a sound like being yelled at by birds as if they were saying, hey, we got to say something right now. Hurry up and rest up and, and get yourself restored because God is about to do a new thing. Or maybe they were shouting, hurry up and get well nourished because next year, soon and very soon, we're going to move on to flourished. Amen. Bishop Dottie, thank you so much for that Episcopal address, encouraging us to rest and nourish our mind and bodies and soul so that we can go out and do the work of ministry. And since this is your first annual conference here at CalPAC as our Episcopal leader, I would like to once again welcome you and say how happy we are to be in ministry with you. For over a year now, we have been embracing the image of murmuration as describing who we are and who we can be as a community of faith in the annual conference. A murmuration, a flock of starling birds dancing across the sky and have been studied by scientists for decades. How are they able to move and shift so effortlessly without bumping into one another? Why do fly in this fluid patterns rather than a V formation like geese? Why do they fly together at all? 
As our lovely bishop explained, a murmuration fly together for safety, warmth, and to find a collective place to rest. The implication of this is clear. We can find nourishment in community. As your conference lay leader, I often have the opportunity to hear from our laity, visit our churches, and talk with leadership. It is true, the complexity of doing ministry during a pandemic and now trying to find a new normal has been challenging. We have persevered, but without consequence. Many of our clergy and laity are tired, overwhelmed, and grieving the many losses from COVID and beyond. But I believe that we can come together to make the commitment and to find the resources, support one another, to heal together, and to envision a ministry beyond our present circumstances. We can find nourishment in community. What is a nourished church? What does a nourished church look like? How does it function? What does it value? Here are a few of my thoughts inspired by Bishop Dottie's Episcopal address. Our conference and its leaders become nourished through intentional and collective efforts that prioritize spiritual growth, fostering community, and developing a deep, deep connection with God. The story of Elijah illustrates that. The challenges Elijah faced helped him to grow in his faith and to connect with God. And God never left Elijah alone. He sent ravens, angels, earthquake, windstorms, and fire. God nourish Elijah, and I know God will nourish us. A nourished church is one that N, navigates, O, offers, U, unites, R, rest, I, initiates, S, serves, and H, honors. A nourished church navigate change well. Just like our physical bodies, when the body of Christ is overworked, overwhelmed, our ability to withstand change is diminished. Change is inevitable part of life, and it can be both exciting and challenging, but a nourished church understands that in the midst of change, there is an opportunity for growth, renewal, and transformation. When a church is nourished and embrace change with faith and resilience, it recognizes that God is the author of change. Trust in God's faithfulness, believing that God is working all things together for good. As we navigate change, it is essential that we remain open collaborative and honest, and I believe that God will bless us with a renewed stamina, deepened faith, and greater opportunity to lead a transformational ministry. A nourished church offers. Have you ever heard the saying that they can't give from an empty cup? Well, the reality is many of our clergy and laity have been doing just that. They have put their well-being on a back burner and continue to show up and serve family, friends, and the church. 
This is unsustainable, friends, and eventually leads to health pro problems, broken relationship, and ethical breaches. Yes. Our bishop right here is encouraging us to find ways to fill our cups so that we can give from the overflow so that we can be healthy and generous. And God know that in these times, offering more love, grace, and forgiveness is exactly what is needed. A nourish church unite. Many of the division that we are experiencing in our congregations, community, and nation is result of stress and drama. Hurt people hurt people. But when we worship together, when we let the peace of Christ, which surpasses all understanding, wash over our lives, our hearts overflow with a love that knows no bounds. We come together supporting one another in times of joys and sorrows, extending a helping hand and standing in solidarity through life challenges. In this nourished church, division melt away and walls crumble. The focus shifts from differences to the common place we all share. Our faith and devotion. It becomes a place where diversity is celebrated and unity is cherished. Hallelujah. A nourished church takes the time it needs to rest. In our fast-paced world where busyness and constant activity are the norm, rest has become a rare and precious commodity. However, in the heart of a church, rest is not just a physical act. It is a spiritual practice that nourishes and rejuvenates the soul. A nourished church recognizes the importance of rest, not just for the individuals, but for the entire community. It understands that rest is not a sign of weakness, but a source of strength. It is a moment of rest that we find the space to connect with God. This is an area where clergy and laity can work together. Congregation can support their pastor in taking time off to care for their well-being, but it also means clergy and laity working in partnership sharing the load and not depending on the same few people to do all the work of the church. When a church embraces rest, it becomes a sanctuary where weary soul finds solace, where burdens are laid down and where hearts find healing. In the restful embrace of a nourished church, Lives are transformed and hope is renewed. A Norris Church initiate the transformation that we all know are needed. We all know that we cannot do ministry the way we always done it. Maintaining the status quo is unsustainable and undermines our mission to make disciples of Jesus Christ. With all of the pressures of the day, it can be easy to become passive observers waiting for someone else to step forward and make a difference. But a Norris church understand that we are called to be ambassadors of God's love in the world and to make the necessary change to strengthen our witness, our ministry, and our life together. 
a nourished church is not satisfied with simply maintaining that status quo. It recognizes it has been entrusted with a message of hope, love, and transformation. It is not enough to simply gather within the walls of our congregation. We must take the initiative to go beyond our comfort zone, to engage with a community and with the world, to listen to the stories of others, share in their joys and sorrows, and walk alongside them on their journey. Let us be a nourished church that initiate change rather than simply waiting for change to come. Let us be bold in our actions, persistent in our pursuit of justice, and unwavering in our commitment to make a difference. A nourished church serves. A nourished church stands apart by embracing the call to serve others. When a church is nourished, it becomes the hands and feet of Christ in a world exemplifying humility, reaching out to the marginalized, the forgotten, and the broken, offering a listening ear, a shoulder to lean on, and a practical support. Serving others become the heartbeat of a nourished church. What would it look like in our conference, in every congregation, if we created an environment where everyone, everyone is welcome, valued, and seen? In a gospel, Matthew 20, 28, reminds us that Jesus did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life for the liberations of many. What if we show up like Jesus, not looking to impose our will on others or win a vote, but to serve for the highest good of all? As we serve, we will witness lives being changed, hearts being healed, and hope being restored. We will become a powerful force for good, a catalyst for positive transformation. Friends, and lastly, a nourished church honors God and one another. In the busyness of our lives, it's easy to lose sight of what truly matters. But a nourished church understands that its ultimate purpose is to honor and glorify God in all that it does. When a church is nourished, it seeks to align its action, its worship, and its very existence with the will of God. It acknowledges God's love and grace and becomes a place where God's presence is felt and God's name is exalted. I believe that it's important for CalPAC Conference to take more time to devote ourselves to collective prayer, study, and discernment of God's will for our future. Because honoring God is not just confined to Sunday morning worship services. It must permeate every aspect of who we are and what we do, influencing how we treat one another, how it serves, we serve our community, and how we represent Christ to the world. Cowback family, we must be a place where everyone feels seen, heard, and value, even when we disagree. Friends and family, my hope and prayer is that our conference will come together 
to nourish ourselves by growing together in love, fostering a greater sense of connection and community by reflection of God's love and saving grace to one another and to the world. Praise God for our life together. Amen. So in case you didn't think laity could preach. <laughs> All right, we're going to move on and watch a video on our jurisdictional and general delegates. I hope the media team is ready for this. Aloha, beloved community, Bishop Dottie, and our CalPAC Annual Conference. I'm Reverend Allison Mark, originally second elected clergy delegate for the much-delayed General Conference 2020, but now filling the very large shoes of Bishop Cedric Bridgeforth, who has been elected as Episcopal leader of the Greater Northwest Episcopal Area. Due to this change in leadership, I now serve as the first elected clergy and the head of the delegation. Let me introduce you to my dear friend and partner in leadership, Mona Lisa. Maloy Lele, my name is Mona Lisa Tuitahi and I'm the first elected lay delegate. Delayed General Conference 2020 is now scheduled for April 23rd to May 3rd, 2024 at Charlotte, North Carolina. Though the dates have changed several times in the last four years, as well as the location, the theme and know that I am God, based on an excerpt from Psalm 46, has not changed and continues to proclaim that though the denomination is going through troubled water, God is still God. The last several years has not been easy for any of us, but as a delegation, we received the time as a gift that allowed us to develop and mold a cohesive body that was instrumental in leading and doing the hard work of, among other things, electing Episcopal leadership at the Western Jurisdiction meeting last November. It was a sacred honor to discern God's will and to offer to the denomination for such a time as this. Bishop Carlo Rapanute, our very own Bishop Cedric Bridgeforth, and our new resident bishop, Bishop Dottie Escobedo Frank. As you can see, Episcopal elections, resignation, changes in status, and other life changes in the last four years have altered the delegation's makeup. Currently, the general delegates, in addition to Allison and myself, are Reverend Sandy Alwine, Mark Stevenson, Reverend Molly Vetter, and Melimaka. The reserves are Joanne Fukumoto, Rachel Gibson, Reverend Tom Choi, and Reverend John Farley. Delayed General Conference 2020 will not be an ordinary legislative session and will be pivotal in determining the next iteration of the United Methodist Church in the world. While there are multiple proposals to split the, de the denomination after decades of debate over LGBTQ inclusion, separation is already happening. Legislation will include efforts such as the Christmas Covenant to restructure the global denomination so that its different geographic regions will each have greater autonomy and stand on equal footing. As, as a delayed general conference, all petitions submitted for 2020 general conference are still valid for consideration in 2024 with a new window for submission of petition and that will open until September 6, 2023. As we look to General Conference and beyond, it is critical that the delegation continue to maintain the cohesive body that we have built in the last several years. Now, the purpose of our maintaining the structure of both general and jurisdictional conference delegates is that we maintain a cohesive body that works together and represents the diverse voices of our annual conference. As you can see, these are your clergy and lay elected delegates. 
you may have noticed that our delegation of 30 has decreased in size due to the long years of pandemic. And eight of our original elected delegates are no longer serving in this capacity. We wanna thank them for their service and the important contributions that they gave to the annual conference and continue to give. The departure creates eight current vacancies in the delegation, specifically four clergy and four lay, all reserve delegates to the Western Jurisdictional Conference, which will take place on July 10th through 13th, 2024. Though an election at this annual conference is not mandated by the recent decision 1472 of the Judicial Council, as we do not have any vacancies in our allotted general conference seats, the delegation, in collaboration with the bishop and conference secretary, support holding an election at this annual conference. Doing so will ensure that we have a full roster to do the important work that goes on in preparation for general conference and at jurisdictional conference as well and that the newly elected will be fully onboarded for the work of jurisdictional conference, including electing Episcopal leadership. Now, this brings me to my ask today and to our ask from the delegation. As we look to elect, we invite you, the body of the CalPAC Annual Conference, to be intentional and prayerful. If you feel called to be nominated, please be mindful of the time and commitment including the dates of both general conference and jurisdictional conference, as well as monthly delegation meetings and other necessary meetings and gatherings as we prepare for both general conference and jurisdictional conference. As you discern on who might best do that work, we are asking that you remember the distinct voices and the diverse voices that we have lost due to the changes in the last several years. We've lost two African-Americans, We've lost a Hispanic Latino. We've lost an Asian American. We've lost four young adults and several delegates who identified as part of the LGBTQ plus community. And those are just to name a few. We need those voices. As a conference, we are hopeful that we can continue to diversify our delegation to better represent who we are as a conference. Now, finally, we covet your prayer during the stormy season in the life of the church. Know that we are available for all of your questions and queries about General Conference, and we eagerly invite your participation. Mahalo, and may you be filled with the Holy Spirit as we continue to do this work together. God bless. Thank you for that video. We will be coming back to discuss that later on, but I appreciate all the work from all the delegation and the ways that you have carried us forward in the, in the greater United Methodist Church. <coughs> we have a prayer request from Reverend Rachel Tabutal from Santa Clarita United Methodist Church. Wanda McNeil, who is a lay member from Santa Clarita, received a breast cancer diagnosis recently and cannot attend today because she is getting her MRI and her PT scans. And uh, she has requested prayers for healing. So if you don't mind, let's pray for a second here. Oh God, Wanda has come to you asking for healing and health and wholeness. And because she is one of ours, she comes to her community asking that we support her in our prayers. So God, we lift her to you. We ask that you would do the amazing things that you created our bodies to do, which is to, to heal itself, to work with the doctors, to be restored back to health. So bring that to her and surround her with a loving community that walks this journey with her. And may her praise be spread throughout our world. In Jesus we pray, amen. We're going to have a prayer for lunch, and so I'm going to ask Tima Finau to come forward. After the prayer for lunch, we're going to have um, a short moment talking about mission service opportunity, and then, um, then we'll be able to go to lunch. So this is Tima Finau. She is our very own Global Mission uh, Fellow, and has been... Go ahead. Thank you. Thank you. 
She has been serving these past two years in Tampa, Florida as a youth and children's ministry coordinator at a nonprofit called Metropolitan Ministries. Welcome. We're glad you're here. Thank you, Bishop, and thank you, Anna, uh, P CalPAC Conference for having me. Even though I'm in Florida, these are still my roots. Mm -hmm. So please hear these words as I say a prayer so we can enjoy our lunch. Thank you, Heavenly Father, for being with each and every individual within this room and having travel mercy so that we can get here safely and those joining us through Zoom. As we enter this time of nourishment, allow us to use this time of fellowship to rest and connect with one another so that we are better equipped to serve one another through your guidance and strength. Feed us mind, body, and soul so that we may use that energy to speak, listen, and make the necessary changes as we continue our day and the rest of the week. We know that all those things that we are doing here is to glorify your name and we use that to carry us throughout the whole week. In your name we pray, amen. amen. All right. Uh, so if, if uh, Denise Barnes can please come forward, she's going to uh, help us with a mission activity. And then lunch will be at noon, and you will be returning here at 2 after your long, drawn-out, enjoyable lunch. <laughs> <laughs> Good morning, everybody. Let's, let's do something, shall we? Mm -hmm. So a quick update, first of all. Um, last night, we were able to find places for nine of the p people that were uh, deposited at um, Union Station. They're all in San Diego, thanks to Christ Ministry Center, who stepped up and took all nine. <laughs> And that's particularly relevant to the work we're doing. We know there are more buses on the way. We know there are more people. We have to step up and do more. We've got a system and it's working. So I just want you to just listen to me for a few minutes as I share a story with you. Imagine, if you will, that you live in Ghana. You live in one of the poorest parts of that country, a country which is politically unstable, has some pretty heinous laws, where there is much violence and human bodies are not considered sacred. It's not safe for you to exist there. You and your wife are outcasts, unable to get any work, struggling to find enough food and living your lives in fear. You can't go on like this. There's no quality to your life and you are simply existing and mostly not doing that terribly well. And then you've just found out that you're expecting a baby. You cannot bear the thought of raising a child there in that country where you are, and you need to do everything you can for the sake of that baby. So you speak with your family. It's a big extended family, and they all live pretty close to each other, and you tell them you're going to try and come to the United States. There you might have a chance. There you might be safe, better, more secure, not filled with fear and struggles. And you know because you've seen it on the TV, it's the land where dreams come true and everyone can succeed. You already have some family there in Boston and they will sponsor you. You just have got to get there to them. How hard can that be? It can't be any worse than the existence you're currently living. So your family gathers together everything they have and gets enough money to pay for you both to fly to Mexico from where it will be easy to get to the border and cross into the United States by claiming asylum. So you get to Mexico and you make your way to the border and you see thousands of other people who have had the same idea as you. And you have to wait here. There's a new system being implemented and you cannot cross the border until you have an appointment made through an app on your phone. You use the last of your money to pay for some internet access on your phone and you get yourself an appointment. But that appointment is three months away. You have no money left, nowhere to live, no shelter. You don't know anyone and are struggling to understand because the language is so different. Someone helps you and takes you to a shelter. They're you and your wife who is by now five months pregnant and needs to rest. 
are given beds in a dormitory where you will share a bathroom with all of the others who are also staying there waiting for their appointments. There's very limited access to any health care. Maternity clinics are impossible to find, but you have somewhere to sleep, some food, and some shelter. Finally, the day of your appointment arrives. You get up early because you have to be there at 7 a.m. When you get there, you find that everybody's appointment that day is set for 7 a.m. You wait and wait. You have water, but no food and no money. At 11 o'clock, you're called for your appointment, and it takes over 90 minutes for you to be processed, but you're granted asylum. Praise God and hallelujah. You have to wait until around 4 p.m. for everyone to have had their appointments and still with only water to drink and no food. Your wife is getting uncomfortable. She's growing and she's 32 weeks pregnant and pretty uncomfortable most of the time, and it's hot. When you're escorted through the border and get to the other side, there are people there waiting to greet you. You're promised free accommodation, free food, and transportation to where you need to be. So you gratefully get in their van with them. They take you to a hotel, and it's there that you discover this is not all that it seems to be. You can sleep in the bed, but you're not allowed to use the air conditioning. You get one meal a day. And then when these helpers find out that you have no money and have to get to Boston, you're told they can't help you. You have 48 hours to sort yourselves out, and after that, you are turned out onto the streets. How can this be here in this land of plenty where all can succeed and live their dream? Luckily, you've taken a card from another organization which was also there when you came through the border. You call them and they come to your rescue. They put you up in a hotel, get you plenty of food, and within 36 hours you are at the airport boarding a flight to Boston, a flight which a new organization has got the funding for you, and they've even given you some extra money to pay for food along the way. This, my friends, is based on a true story. The organization which finally was able to come to their aid was Calexico United Methodist Church through the work of Pastor Baldwin. We're working hard at developing new ways for us to help these people as they cross the border, and there are so many of them. San Diego is in a state of emergency because of the sheer volume of people who are coming through. And we need your help, and you've already stood up so much. All of the collections during this annual conference are going to help support our border work. But there are many other ways in which you can help, and one of them is by writing cards of welcome for these people who have just arrived on our shores. There are resources here to help you write those cards, and the ushers are going to come forward and hand them out to you. So just take a few minutes. Think about what you would like to say. What words of welcome and hope can you offer people whose journey is still far from over? In addition, we're working with an organization named Border Compassion, which works with some of the shelters in Mexicali and were the ones who came up with the $700 needed to get the flights for the couple from Ghana to make it to Boston. Border Compassion, among other things, provides days of celebration and joy for those who are marking time in shelters in Mexicali as they wait for their appointments. I recently went down with them to, uh, to a Mother's Day celebration, and I know that some of them would love to be able to have some of these cards as they help people come through too. So please, take a few minutes. There's pens and cards being given out, and as you leave for lunch, there'll be boxes at the back for you to drop these in, and we can give a true United Methodist welcome to these people that are joining us in this country. Thank you. All right, have fun writing your cards. Say something sweet and nice and welcoming. <laughs> And uh, yes, and Bob's gonna make an announcement for us before we go. I like that. Hi, friends. Bob Rhodes, La Jolla UMC clergy, practicing. Uh, 
Uh, just a reminder, please take all the time it takes uh, to do this good work, to say these words of welcomes to persons who have been on such a long journey. And when you leave this space, many of you are going to the laity lunch. And for those of you who are going to the laity lunch, please exit out the back doors. If you are eating in the brasserie or somewhere else, please use the side doors. Uh, that will just help with the flow of traffic. Please do not use these doors uh, to your right and my left. Thank you. <laughs>